We are going to talk about experimental design and computer vision. Uh, the lecture title and schedule is a bit different. We'll connect those dots as we go along. Um, and I want to sort of get back first to what have you been doing so far. So, so far in the last two weeks, you've been working hard, starting with something reasonable, checking validation performance. Usually it wasn't good enough for what you wanted for your data, and then you make a reasonable change, and then you try again, and then maybe it's better. But today's lecture is going to be about, is it actually better? How do we know? How do we test? And how do we design experiments such that we can reliably say that our method is better than some other method, or this component in our system is better than some other component? So we're going to start with a really quick in fair share and just to get everyone on board and wake you up. So what ideas are you trying to get to, to are you trying out to improve your baseline? So two minutes. Think for one minute, share for one minute. Go. So.
how can we demonstrate progress? So we might have a baseline and a took A and a took B, and we might get a graph like this, where Y is our performance matrix and these are different methods. And then today's lecture, we're going to talk about two types of things. How we demonstrate that one method is better than another. So this is called sometimes in computer vision a fair comparison. And we're asking two things here. How do we build controlled experiments uh, that show progress? And what should we even control for in this messy computer vision system? Um, and the second thing we're going to look at is what makes a method good. And this is oftentimes referred to as a, an ablation study. And we want to think about a single method, a single system, and then we want to sort of pry out the different blocks that make it and maybe ablate them, so remove them, and see how is the performance without them. OK? Um, yeah, OK, let's continue. So we're going to start with what makes one method better than another. So I'm showing you this graph. And what we're actually saying, if we try to take it more to our world of ecology, is that we have a control. We have a treatment A, and we have a treatment B, or a condition A and condition B. We're just trying to compare between them. And we want to do it in a controlled manner, manner as we would in biology and ecology, right? So what's the first thing you do when you design an experiment? Looking for answers from the crowd. Think about what data you need. <laughs> okay, other answers? You figure out what question you're trying to answer. Yeah, yeah. you think of an hypothesis. All right. So, what's your hypothesis? Finishes, what's your hypothesis? For what? <laughs> for your system. For it changes you you think will improve the baseline. Oh, well, I thought, like, Sicily, that, uh, like, maybe preserving aspect ratio is important for my data set. So I thought that if I had it sort of like Sicily described, I might get better metrics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you thought that method A is better than method B for your task. Does that make sense? So methods for us generally will fall into one of these three blocks pre-processing which is padding or augmentations architecture which is the backbone you're using so a resonant versus a bgg versus transformers stuff like that and a loss function and over all of these blocks we have sort of this Scalable shape of hyperparameters, which we have to work at, um, in, like tuning, and we'll get to that. All right, so as I said, for pre processing, method A might be used image padding, and method B might be used image resizing. And we'll see your example further down the line. For architecture, it might be ResNet or VGG, and for loss, it might be focal loss or it may be cross entropy loss if you're doing classification. But what makes for a fair comparison and an unfair comparison? So what do I mean by fair and unfair? Martin? I know that the methods that you've chosen are actually suitable for this particular problem. Yeah, maybe, use, I don't know. maybe if you use a method that's totally un could like unsuitable for your problem that could be an unfair comparison. Kara? I was gonna say like um comparing apples to apples, like you've only changed one thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Everything else is the same. Exactly. So it it really depends also on your hypothesis. Like this is why you want to sort of like figure out what you're asking. So let's take an example. If my hypothesis is that focal loss is better than cross entropy loss with classifying kelp on the kelp Chris forever data set. <laughs> then, and I'm doing this for comparison where I'm comparing a focal loss with a resonant backbone of 101, which has 45 million parameters, and a cross entropy loss with a resonant 18, which has 11 million parameters. This is sort of unfair because I gave 
method A, an unfair advantage, because I gave it a backbone with a lot more parameters. And if my data set is big, it's going to have better expressive powers. So I can fix this by just stabilizing the backbone and changing the loss. Or I can have a different question where deeper architectures perform better on the data set. And then I would keep the loss the same, but change the architecture. So this is sort of one concept of what is fair. So fair is that only one reasonable explanation, there's only one reasonable explanation where method A is better than method B. Like I can't map multiple explanation, have multiple explanations for method A being better. And this is sometimes like hard to suss out. Sometimes if you're comparing two fundamentally different methods, as Martin said, it could be difficult, right? If you're comparing random forests to the CNN, both are classifiers, you're gonna have a hard time controlling all the different levels of unfairness there, all the different axes of variation. And the other version of what is fair or unfair is that there is also no obvious way to improve the performance of method B. So a lot of times we don't give as much effort to the baseline as we would to our very cool idea, which we are sure would work. And we need to give equal effort at like trying to improve both methods. So this is sort of like touches upon human bias a little bit and researcher bias, right? This is why psychologists have double-blind experiments. They don't want to sort of poison the data. Um, so we want to give equal effort to both methods, I would say. OK. And now we have an example with comparing loss functions. So why do we want to keep the same? So we might want to keep the pre-processing the same. We might want to keep the architecture the same, right? But do we want to keep the hyperparameters the same? Hey, Kara. Good morning. <laughs> For your loss function? Question? Proud? Thoughts? Then? I'd say yes, if you can. Unless sometimes the loss could interact with some hyperparameters, but maybe that's difficult to figure out. Yeah. It's difficult. This is why we actually don't want to keep it the same, um, because different losses would have different sort of, <laughs> yeah, different learning rates would be better for different losses, different learning schedules, different batch sizes would affect certain um, loss functions more than others. For example, the Sinclair uh, loss function needs a very large batch. Um, so we want to keep sort of our hyperparameter tuning effort, our effort at making the method better, sort of similar. And in general, when we ask what should we control for, we should usually freeze two of these blocks and change one, but also keep the hyperparameter tuning effort similar. And within the realm of reason, because we're not a big tech company. Right, so Vinicius. <laughs> uh, so Vinicius was kind enough to give me his data for a case study. Um, so as Cicely, both Sicily and uh, Vinicius described, they have this problem where they have some information of shape and size in their data, which they think might be degraded if you resize to 224 by 224 uh, naively, which is what is commonly used in, uh, I guess, most pipelines. So the question I have for you guys is what do we need to control for for this case when we're trying out these two methods and what should we not control for? And this is a discussion, there is no right or wrong answer. Yeah. Um, it's something I, I still don't know the answer to, mm -hmm. but, um, <clears throat> is if 
less if you have like small images or images that are padding a lot if the degree of padding might affect your results but i, I saw that in the answer but that's something i thought about yeah uh, i didn't know the answer to that it seems from uh, vinicius's initial prize that it doesn't um have too much of a different thing like vinicius uh it seems like the improve like if there is any improvement it's pretty minor yeah, it's but also that's dependent on the class. And uh, we were like surprised because you can see, for example, the second row, the bubble class, it's pretty tiny and it's getting resized to something quite big. So we're kind of surprised. Did the bubble class have a major improvement? Uh, I don't think so. Yeah. But the nice thing was that um, the classes that we did see the largest differences were the ones for that, like, if if you change the aspect ratio, you might expect the label to change. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's cool. All right. Uh, so what we can control for, I guess, is data set, um, architecture, uh, loss function. And the reason, like, this is a fairly straightforward example. I think we can control for most things. All right. Another example, um, Justin's reading group, I think, read this paper. This is from a paper called Metric Learning Reality Check. And what we have here is a graph showing uh, the advance through the years of uh, metric learning. Um, so each group of bars is a different loss function, and each color is a different data set. And we can clearly see that through the years, uh, there is supposedly an improvement in metric learning. Uh, metric learning is a field where you're trying to learn um, sort of encoding space, embedding space, that is the distances between samples is meaningful in some way. All right, and then what these researchers found, uh, I'm just going to read out the site, one widely cited paper from 2017 used ResNet 50 and then claimed huge performance gains. This is questionable because then the computing methods use Google Net, which is an older architecture, uh, which has significantly lower initial accuracies. Therefore, much of the performance gain likely came from the choice of network architecture and not the proposed method, the proposed method being a different loss function. Okay. And when um, they actually retrained everything with these losses and sort of kept all of the hyperparameter tuning to the same effort and stabilized the architecture, they actually found that there was no, not much progress being made. Okay. And now, a second news case. So, uh, Cicely, I uh, hope it's okay. We brought your uh, bar augmentations problem. Uh, so, Cicely, you want to present your problem for us? <laughs> or do you want me to do it? No, I can. Um, yeah, basically, there are some species that are quite rare in market. So, um, when I tried, <clears throat> like starting the project before, we tried to um, mask some cage bars and then like randomly copy and paste them on top of the image but the problem was the masks were a bit shit um and they were like because the background was quite messy it was quite difficult to segment them out um and then i tried something similar with photoshop during my phd um but coding in photoshop was quite difficult and um it was quite difficult to rotate the cage bar masks to put on top of, top of the images so either for wild images or examples where a photo was taken in a market, but maybe someone took a photo through the bars or like the, the bird wasn't in a cage for a reason. So I maybe made the mistake of mentioning it to Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> we um, had a look at ways to like gem and, um, generate, generate, yeah. So like, um, cage, like grids of bars and stuff. Uh, and then Sarah to get a step further <laughs> um, and was playing around with like how you can, because you still want to generate enough randomness. So can you change the color of the bars? Can you um, change the gaps between the bars? Can you stretch them? Can you rotate them at random degrees? Yeah. 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 So it's a very cool 
The real question is whether it makes any difference at all. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. So, a fair comparison. <laughs> so, yeah. So, how do we do a fair comparison for something like this? What's changing from, for example, using no augmentations and just uh, pictures of birds in cages? What's the um, problem with that? Well, obviously, um, if you if you don't change it with enough um, randomness, the model might just overfit to a certain type of cave bar or colour or uh, positioning um, or level of blur. I, I'm not even looking at overfitting at the moment. I'm just asking, like, why do we need to... And why do we need to use... No, why do we need to control for when we're comparing these two methods? Like, what might change? So, for example, the data set size may change when introducing new images. Or, um, yeah, could be that these images, maybe INAT images come from a different distribution. So it's kind of tricky. It's a, it's a more tricky case. Uh, we'll get back to that in the end after relation studies. You want to add Yeah, just... Um... Anytime you're changing your data set, that's okay. That can be like a, a method you're introducing. Like we came up with a clever way to use more images, but you do want to make sure that you don't change your test set yeah. because you need to make sure that the metrics you're comparing across the two things are actually directly comparable. Mm -hmm. So if you come up with some clever way, for example, like what Ben is doing to try to incorporate a lot more training data without labels, you still want to make sure you're comparing that to training with just the labeled data and keep the same test set so that you can say actually the number changes in some notable way. Thank you. All right, so we came up with a checklist for you. Uh, so suppose you found that method A is better than method B. What do you need to check? Did you control for differences unrelated to your proposed method? So as we said, freeze two of these blocks, change one. Can you think of a way to improve the performance of method B? Bonus point, if you can think of giving B an unfair advantage and still not as good as your method, this is actually like, this would strengthen your method even more. Did you invest as a, the same amount of uh, hyperparameter tuning effort for both methods? Did you change the data set between the methods? Keep the test set the same, as Sarah said. And then did you, we are aware that you can't keep everything stable ever for everything, but just explicitly point out any unfairness you can get rid of. Honestly, is the best policy here. All right. Um, we're moving on to something a bit different. So questions about fair comparisons? Um, sorry, can I just ask, mm -hmm. um, what is an example of unfairness that you might not be able to get rid of? Uh, if you're using CMN versus uh, random forest, you, there are explicit inherent things you can you can get rid of. Um, just, uh, but would you not just technically categorize them then as different like parts of the same study? So, if you take a random forest and you're comparing it to a CNN, and the CNN has 25 million parameters, and the random forest has a couple thousand parameters. Um, then really you might not be directly comparing whether a convolutional neural network approach versus a random forest approach is better. You might just be saying um, more flexibility or more parameters in the model is better. So one way that people do try to do this if they're like comparing two different architecture types is they'll try to find a version of those architectures where they have the sim like the similar number of parameters. So you're not somehow saying like, oh, okay, my transformer is always better than, like transformers are always better than CNNs, but actually your transformer had way more parameters. So it's, it's about trying to measure as fairly as possible the, the real thing that you're trying to claim. And you might be claiming um, a transformer with way more parameters does better than a CNN with less parameters. And that's okay if that's the thing you're claiming. But if you just are saying transformers are always better than CNNs, but you haven't taken into account the fact that you're giving it way more computational power, then that's potentially an unfair. Yeah, I think another thing that I see very common is that um, papers compare two methods um, on their data set, but they're like personally very biased towards the one method and they don't spend the same hyperparameter tuning effort for both methods. And then sometimes I read the paper and I'm like, 
Okay, it is very expensive to put in all that hyperparameter tuning effort, like get the GPUs and like pay for the GPUs. Not every lab, lab can afford that. So in that case, I think like I, I wish these papers would have been very transparent about exactly the number of hyperparameters that they did try. Mm -hmm. And that's something very easy that one can do without spending all the GPU to just be very clear about here's the list of hyperparameters and possible combinations that I did try out. And then uh, yeah. mention, okay, I didn't spend the same effort on both methods. Yeah, that transparency thing. And you can put all that stuff in the supplementary material, right? Yeah. But you can say, like, you know, uh, for the baseline, we we did, like, this amount of basically, like, hyperparameter tuning. We recognize that this may not be a perfectly optimal baseline, but we think it's reasonable because within this set of hyperparameter tuning, you know, 10 out of the 20 models we trained all were basically maxing out around these values and we weren't really seeing much above that. So you can try to be reasonable even if you can't be comprehensive. Yeah. You have the link thing? So for example, when you have two data augmentation techniques and you said, Sarah, very well that you want to keep the test the same. But what about the validation? Are you should you also should it be also similar with the test, or do you allow different augmentation, augmented images to end up in the validation? I mean, Does so it, it's basically like the test set is the thing you want to be very fair on. The validation set is the way that you're choosing the model that you want to use to test. So you can choose the model using whatever system you want, right? Whatever things you want. You should be transparent about it. Um, we chose our optimal method using early stop stopping on a validation set that included this additional hyperparameter tuning. And then this is how that model performed on our test set. Um, so as long as you're very clear about why you made the choices you did, it actually, you can make your own validation set out of whatever you want, kind of, right? It's, it, um, if you are reporting your metrics on the validation set, which you see in a lot of papers, maybe you don't have enough data to have a validation and test, then again, you should be very clear about the, the choices you made that like doing model selection on that validation set that may not actually be representative of true test performance because you were looking at performance of the model in order to choose the best model which is something you can't do in reality. So just like try to be very, very, very explicit about what you did as much as you can. All right, any more questions? Let's carry on. All right, so one more thing uh, that's sort of beyond fair comparisons is considering your lower and upper bounds. What is the worst you can do on your task and what is the best you could reasonably do on your task? So this is an example from the main adaptation. It's a paper I read with my group last week. Uh, so in the main adaptation, you have the setting is you have a source that's some images, in this case, colored numbers from like signs, and you have labels for the source domain, and you don't have labels for the target domain, but domain with the other data, and you're training on unlabeled and labeled, and you want to do well on your target domain. That's the task. Now, what uh, Ranin and Pitsky did in uh, their paper is they had this table where it goes from the worst you could do uh, to the best you could do. So the worst you could do in a domain adaptation task is training only on your source, only where you have labels, and just deploying the model on the target and seeing what it does. So that's the first flow. The best you could do is actually getting labels for your target and training on your target. That's the bottom row. And then they have their method somewhere in the middle. And this is sort of like gives you context to if you have a hard task, like the main adaptation, which Vinicius, for example, might have, you need to get some sort of sanity check of how well could you do. Like if you have a test set and it's you don't know that it's a lot harder than what you're trained on, but you're trying to do well on it. It could be that it's not your method. It could be that the test set is just hard, and even if you were to train a classifier, it wouldn't do well. This happened. This happened to me <laughs> recently, actually. Uh, so it's just like it's not fair, but it's a way to get an intuition of what your data is like and how hard is the task you're trying to accomplish. And actually, another thing I just thought of, which is very, very relevant to all of you, because ecologists are working with real-world data. A really good thing to do is to do some sort of um, sampling of your test data 
go through and verify what percentage of error you have in the labels on your test data. Mm -hmm. Because you are never going to be able to predict, if, if you have 5% error in your test labels, like something's just mislabeled as being empty or mislabeled with the wrong species, which happens most of the time, like most camera trap data sets I've worked with have somewhere between five and 10% error. You are never going to be able to do better than that because actually at that point, even if your model is doing the right thing, you're penalizing, that you're, you're penalizing it in your metric. Like the correct answer, it's getting it right and you're saying it's wrong. So a really good upper bound for all of us in this room is like the incorrect, the percentage of labels that are incorrect in your test data. Because you are never going to be able to do better than that. And if you are doing better than that, then that's a little fishy, right? Like if your model is correctly labeling things that are wrong, that's yeah. a bit fishy. That's a really good point. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, is there like a rule of thumb for how like a fraction of your data to get like a representative sample? Because like if you have a lot of test data, you can't go through all of it. Yeah, yeah. It's super hard. I, in practice, what I've done is something like um, oh, I'll take like a hundred examples at random, or I'll take like a hundred examples, or like, you know, 10 examples per class, like just a rough sense. And I know that it's not, and I explain in the thing, like this is the way that we got this rough sense of error. This may not be, you just explain everything as much as you can. Um, one of the other things we did is one paper, we were seeing that our method was consistently underperforming in the places that it was most confident. And so we, we did is we took the 100 most confident predictions of our model where uh, the metric was saying we were wrong. And we went through all of those and we found that actually only three of them was our model actually wrong and the other 97 were the labels were wrong. So it was just this way of being like, hey, like we haven't gone through all the data, but when our model's very confident um, and then we checked it, we found that 97% of the time it was actually correct. Yeah. Good. Um, questions on comparing between methods before we move on to ablation studies. Yes. It wasn't clear what what the metric represented. Oh, that metric. I think it's just uh, accuracy. It's accurate. It's top one accuracy. Top one. Okay. But on the test set or on uh, so you have a source and you have a target. You have labels for the source, you don't have labels for the target, and then you're testing yourself on the target in the end. I test it from the target. So it's sort of like from train to test. Yeah. Yeah, uh, not exactly, because you're moving, so you have two completely separate domains that look different. So you have the source looking funky, and then you have the target looking like a different something. So you're trying to generalize, you're trying to create a model that's good for both of these domains. Okay. Uh, the paper is actually a really nice read. Highly recommend. It's like the bottom. All right, so what makes a method good? We decided on a method and uh, we want to see what what is actually, what sort of moving part in the system actually contributes most to our performance. And so, So we have a method, we started with a baseline, then we added x, and then we added y, but do we really need both x and y? And part of why we need to do the relation studies we were talking about yesterday is that we're sort of like brute forcing our way till we get a good performance metric, or we're like trying a bunch of stuff, we're not really being principled about it, and then we got to something good, and now we need to sort of backtrack and go, okay, but what, like, how does it do without this part of the system? So let's say I have a baseline. Uh, let's say I added X and my performance got better. Let's say I tested my baseline with just Y and it did a little less better. And let's say I tried it with both and it was better. But is it worth it? Do we need to add Y? Well, it depends on what method Y is, if it adds a lot more computation overhead, you might not want to add it. And what if this was the outcome instead? Here, it seems like Y is actually contributing nothing, but 
also performance metrics, we've said hide a lot of stuff. So you could actually get like the same performance metric, like the same single number, but be better on different classes. And then it also depends on what are you really interested in aside from the metric. Um, so here are some examples of ablation studies from uh, SimCLR. So this is the paper that um, Tarun talked about on Friday. Uh, so in SimCLR, augmentations are a huge part of the method and the choice of augmentations was sort of integral to the, to the performance. And I think um, Tarun's group also read this paper. Uh, so they try out a bunch of different um, augmentations, and then they did this ablation study where they test for each. So for each augmentation, they use the rows are the first augmentation and the and transformation, and the columns are the second transformation, and the diagram is just using a single transformation. And the colors are top one accuracy on image case. Okay, so you can see that they did like a very thorough sort of job at testing whether even the order in which you apply the augmentation changes. And this is not even all of the augmentations they used in their paper. In the paper, in the paper, they use like I think a sequence of four augmentations or something. So even them doing a roughly fair job doesn't actually ablate everything they did in the paper. And this is actually a crazy amount of work. <laughs> this, uh, this is an example of what you can do if you have Google scale GPU computation and money. Yes. Um, I don't, like mapping some of this into cost if you were like paying for like GPUs on the cloud or something, like hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not more, maybe a quarter, half a million dollars for a single paper. Yes. None of us are doing this. Yeah, this is like, it's just thing. not, it's just not feasible for academics or mm -hmm. ecologists or basically anyone who isn't Google or Facebook. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So here they are late. So CCLR hinges upon a really high batch size because you're comparing between positive and negative examples. And here, if you look at the batch sizes they tried, they go up to 8,192 images per batch with a thousand training blocks. It's downright greedy. <laughs> <laughs> and also, and also look at the variation in performance, right? Like that top one accuracy, like mm -hmm. the last, like going from 600 to 1,000 epochs, performance is changing very, very little. Very little. And there is essentially almost no difference between the top three batch sizes. It's like, it's kind of minor. Something um, to consider maybe when you're trying to experiment with parameters and don't have a quarter of a million dollars <laughs> is like, you can reduce the computational cost of one experiment. So even if like you eventually want to run your model for 50 or 100 epics and you eventually want to use ResNet 50, like you may be able to test the efficacy of different rinse and augmentations using the smallest network you can for only 10 epics and you might not actually be able to tell kind of how that's going to project onto the final. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Sam. Is yeah. this in any way informative to the general scientific community or it's just like the size doesn't match the uh, yeah, scope? Man. It's a bigger, good bigger back size and training for longer seems to be better. Yes. <laughs> but for this method. For this method. But actually for many methods. Yeah. Um, lar the largest possible batch size that you can training for as long as you can mostly seems to be better. And the, the thing that is counterintuitive that we've learned pretty consistently as a community is we used to think about like um, a lot of times like early stopping, like, oh, your model's gonna truly start overfitting. But in practice, like sometimes that happens, but more often than not, even if your training performance is much better than your validation performance, training for longer, the validation performance will continue to creep up. Um, and But then it's performance on metrics, right? So some of it is actually biased by the fact that your model is basically getting increasingly confident because it's rewarded if the scores are very close to one for the correct answers. So like pushing those scores to one and zero, like more and more, it's making the model less and less calibrated, but maybe maximizing the, 
the actual metrics a bit more. Yeah. So it's, don't look at single metrics, always plot stuff out. Yeah. Yeah. All right, I think we're here too, and we're really good on time, so I'm going to give you longer for this four minutes. Um, so suppose your idea for improving the baseline worked. Can that idea be broken and cut into components? And what kind of relation study would you run on your data? Go. I'll start the clock. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you end up with the exact same image. So, 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 so
study. I have another question. Since yeah. Lena, we're talking. How do you disentangle doing these ablation studies from that thing you were just showing us beforehand about the baseline and adding the different pieces? <laughs> we had this whole, it's, yeah. it's a little bit semantic. We had this whole yeah. conversation about this last yeah. yeah, I so, was uh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe part of it is actually about resource prioritization. So um, maybe one of the reasons that we think about this this way, when we talk about ablation studies, it's often like you find a method that works well, and now you really systematically try to break it down um, and figure out sort of why and what the components yeah. are that contributed. But you may, might not have the resources to do that type of systematic thing from the beginning for every possible combination of things you want to try. Right. So it's like, you throw a bunch of stuff at the wall, see what sticks, and then once you have something that sticks, you try to figure out what made it stick. Yeah, but it's because we don't have the resources to be this systematic for everything we want to try up front. Uh, it that does, so it's largely resonates. Yeah, so the first part is largely like maybe two completely different methods, and this thing is just like a single method where you're right. like sort of prying apart the blocks if you it's kind of a matter of scale like do the big yeah. things see what works and yeah. see how yeah. much of that you can peel apart yeah. and try and disentangle what, exactly. what aspect of it was of that big thing that 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 yeah. really was the main driver. yeah sort of reverse engineering yeah. Yeah. and sometimes problem. you really find like oh okay here's like the method that seems to work better than our baseline and there's maybe three components to that that we can kind of disentangle and then you find like each one of them contributes some amount and the combination of all three does better than any of them and then you're kind of like okay cool so they're all contributing do you see a lot of interactive effects that way or like that like you you yeah. do one effect and there's so two so and small and then together they have a big boost yeah Sometimes. so it's sort of like i truly feel like oh, this field is really like ecology it's a really messy system and you're just trying to figure it out it's 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 there's so many things interacting together both the components and the hyperparameters and we just need to be resourceful and do our best and be transparent about it okay so we don't really have time to go over the patient studies so i'm just gonna continue so uh just to get back to sicily's uh idea of augmentations uh, how would you ablate this? Sicily, how would you ablate this? Um, <laughs> I guess maybe one way you could do it is, is like you would have, let's say, the normal orientation, and then you could just change the thickness, and then just change the color, and then change the orientation of where the grid grids mm -hmm. lie. Mm -hmm. That's and choose a lot of things. Yeah. Maybe a simpler thing would be don't use the augmentation at all and just add the INAT images without it. And see what happens, because it could be... Oh, so sorry, because we're talking about taking away one thing, yeah. Yeah, so it could be that adding the INAT images will actually make you your task a lot harder because it's two really separate <laughs> domains, your images and the INAT images. And it could be that it won't help. Or it could be that it helps a lot already and the bar augmentation doesn't actually make that much of a difference versus just adding additional data. 
So it's, um, yeah, so you need, this was like what we find when we talked about it yesterday, and uh, in both of these situations, you would keep the text set the same and just your images that you're interested in as well. All right, so what is commonly ablated? Uh, terms in loss functions, for example, Chris, you have your thing with the masking, you might want to pull it out, put it back in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Pre-processing steps like augmentations, uh, training data sources and, quanta and quantities, uh, pre-training data sources and quantities. So I actually found in previous work that tra pre-training on another data set that's not only um, kinetics, a different data set just upped the performance, uh, training duration, and um, <laughs> last thing, sorry, why are you close? <laughs> we were getting weird last night. We're, yeah, it was weird. <laughs> um, basically, we were just trying to figure out what's the really important thing. And it's just these, with all of the spare comparisons and ablation studies, you just want to be as systematic as you can with the resources you have and be transparent about what you couldn't do. And then and then she was trying to quote me as like Professor Sarah Beery. <laughs> Scott. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay, this is forever starting the YouTube. Yeah. It'll be on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> so one last part. What bothers you about this graph, ecologist? What's it, what does this scream out? So we had a conversation, this is the point Jess raised in our reading group, that if you've got different seeds and different randomness, as an ecologist, we'd sample something like a hundred times and we'd plot error bars because actually like some of the graphs you show where they're really small, it might not even, it might just be exactly. around. Exactly, well. exactly. Where are our error bars? Stable evaluation. So you can I just ask something about the previous graph? Um, but one thing we were also talking about in the previous think pair one is like, you don't know that X or Y is necessarily better than the other. So that also might not necessarily bother you because we were saying like, if you pick a certain augmentation, you might think it works specifically well for your problem, but there is still some degree of like black box black boxedness or whatever. Yeah. So you might like you might think I don't know randomly cropping would give you a bigger increase because it makes more sense for your problem than blurring does, but then mm -hmm. randomly blurring does better. So mm -hmm. how would you know? You know. <laughs> So well, you can't, you just accept that you No, so you just know. probe the model, poke it, look at look at be another reason why that performs. Because you know, this there doesn't seem to me like an obvious linearity. Mm -hmm. They're yeah. non-linear models. Non -linear models. <laughs> no, but I mean it kind of seems like X and Y and then a combination you might expect to end up giving you better accuracy, but mm -hmm. it might not. So yeah. It, it's just probing and honestly if one of these components is also a lot more computationally intensive mm. slows down your you it. yeah it's a, it's a matter it's there is no right answer you just probe the model and you try think about your use case and consistently try to like pass out what does best mm -hmm. So how do we try and get at stable evaluation? So we do multiple runs, as just said, we don't sort of settle for one run of one model. And then hopefully if we if the method is stable, then we get something like this where method A is consistently better than method B. But it just might not be the case. It might be that method B sometimes does better, and method A sometimes does better, and the methods are just not really stable. This also is frustrating because if you need to run three or ideally more, um, you know, something like 20 yeah. runs for every ablation or every evaluation, now again, your resources are being it's quite complex so there's yeah. just like a, a, a amount of decision making you have to do and sam's point i think is a very 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 good one which is can you do some of these ablations on a smaller model or a smaller set of data can you where like a single run might take 
10 minutes instead of two hours and now you're using your resources more effectively to understand the components and then maybe you train your big model sort of at the end. Again, like, like Cicely said, nothing is really truly linear so you can't maybe directly make that claim, but it's still something you could feasibly do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Respect to stretch, but do you like one of these uh, whatever setups and run it and get a sense of like the variation you see in a run because of the, mm -hmm. you know, the seed or whatever it is that changes. And then when you do something else, if it like kind of falls in that variation, you know, you can't really distinguish it from the normal run variation. And like, maybe it's not worth like trying to read the tea leaves with that. Like, is there a way to kind of see when something rises above the, you know, the churn of like a like you know, the practice that I probably do is just like, do all of my things once and then pick the ones I actually want to like get a distribution of scores. Yeah. 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 Pick the ones that have the like, oh, that looks like it had the largest effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And also stuff that make sense to your data. So ablating um, augmentations could be basically like an infinite rabbit hole. Yeah. Because maybe you're going to use five or six different augmentation strategies and every trying every combination of every number of ablations is just systematically impossible. And so often what you'll do is you'll just be like, all right, well, I did these five ablations, but I'm going to treat ablations as like one component that I will turn on or turn off as a whole, instead of trying to understand the contribution of each of those ablations. And maybe one of them is doing fuck all or actually hurting you, but like you, you make your choice about what. How long do we have these notes for? <laughs> This is this unrelated question. How long do you have what? How long do you have these notes for? Like, <laughs> this week. Just this but week. um, okay. so and this was something we're gonna we're gonna I'm gonna send out a survey because I want to get a sense for um and we did this last year as well like what GPU resources you have as ecologists when you go back home um mm -hmm. just as a sense you know because that is a limitation to being um, able to do a lot of exploration. Let's uh, keep going. All right, so basically this is a really short list of what you can do to um. Strive for more stable evaluation, uh, run multiple times, compare mean and string deviation, change your random seeds, increase the size of your validation set can help. Um, smaller validation set, especially for classification, can make the metrics go wild because uh, one error on one sample means a lot. Uh, you can improve the balance of your validation set or use a flat balance metric, and you can train for longer. And that's it. All right. We have like a few more minutes for questions before the answer comes on. Yeah. Um, for the changing the random seed, mm -hmm. like I, I set a seed when I do some like subsetting and splitting for random files to pull out, but how do you do that? Are you talking about like doing that in actual model training? Yeah, so a lot of the times you can set it in the config file. Um, okay. It's a couple of simple functions in Torch, uh, in PyTorch that you can use. Um, and that, what is it? Is it setting like the random initial weight or what is it? It's setting the it's setting the state of the random number generator, which is meant to help reproducibility. And it's just because these are stochastic models. Yeah. When you generate numbers, setting is this all about the stochastic gradient descent part where it's jumping around? Mm -hmm. Is that where this and enters in? And and the initialization of the model. Yeah, but most of them start with uh, image metrics. What's, um, what's, what's the initialization of the model? Where but, but so but the image not preterm weights, but then the final classification yeah. layer is randomized. So, so you, you initialize your parameters for the model oh, okay. randomly, right. yeah. unless you're starting with image metrics. Um, but then the classifier at the end does get the randomly initialized and okay. Cicely? Um, so <clears throat> I have a couple of questions about the first point. Um, so one is obviously you like create a degree of randomness with your data data, right? Because you, you might mm -hmm. shuffle True. like you have shuffling mm -hmm. to false weather. Um, so presumably that's not sufficient though. So with one round. So would you do something like cross validation so you randomly generate those training and validation splits and then run again because obviously if you're using if you just split once and then you use your validation data you've made a lot of decisions based on that so if you use cross validation on everything again that performed really really well on one trained validation split you could probably like you might end up with a really shit mean 
after that for some reason. Is that possible? Yes. We do cross validation sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's just that later trying to compare it to what you did with cross validation is a bit like if someone came up afterwards or you came up in a few years and tried again um, with cross validation, it's a bit harder to. Uh... So if you use cross validation to select for model selection, but you have a stable static test set that you're always comparing to, then at least the metric you're comparing to is consistent and transparently measurable. Yeah, um, so the challenge test at the same, we regenerate your training validation splits, that still might be... Yeah, uh, it would maybe be better to run your model multiple times and then, like, you mean average over, like, whichever metric you choose is most informative, right? So you would do the mean or... Yeah, mean and um, also look, look at the variation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. variation. So that is kind of similar to... Because if cross validation isn't that useful, is running multiple times like it, it is point. useful, but I guess it's computationally intensive yeah. A yeah. and B, yeah. it's a bit less um, reproducible. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Valentin, one last question, then we we'll talk about. It. All right. So, or when you like the the point where, uh, about improved appearance in your validation set. Um, if you do that, shouldn't you do that in the test data set as well? Or it's, so uh, I guess, it's a risky one. Yeah, I guess it's a risky one. It's, uh, it's, um, this one was Eli's point. I guess it's not really that, like you can sort of get at what's the objectively better model for balance test set, but I'm not sure. Like if you're exploiting the wild, that's kind of tricky. Yes, yeah. especially if you expect that the nature of things are unbalanced, mm -hmm. and your test should be unbalanced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you are right. Yeah. In the end, I think um, no matter how much systematic stuff you do to try to get your best possible validation and even get your best possible metrics on your test set, remember the data you're going to use your model on might be different from your test set. So it's not like the numbers you get on that test set are necessarily what you're going to see in reality anyway. Um, and so you still need to think about this like like verification process. Mm -hmm. All right, so Brontu is here. <laughs>